but the uh, uh, probably uh, the, the, there won't be many more uh, coming in. So uh, that very brief introduction uh, of uh, Carmen and, and Angel, um, the, the work at IRI. Uh, sorry, my name is uh, Francisco Doblas Reyes. I'm the uh, director of the uh, uh, Earth Sciences Department at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And uh, I'm, I, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Carmen, Carmen Gonzalez and Angel Munoz, uh, who work at uh, the Interna International Research Institute for Climate and Society in, uh, in uh, the US, uh, and that uh, have been working on many aspects that uh, are of interest uh, to the uh, people in, uh, in the Earth Sciences Department here at the BSC, uh, and that, that are very much related to uh, the development of climate services in particular in uh, regions that are uh, especially vulner vulnerable to climate, uh, climate variability and climate change. Um, I, I don't want to really uh, uh, take uh, any more time and, uh, and I think it, it will be great to listen to both uh, Carmen and Angel uh, and learn more about the uh, really interesting work that they are doing. So please uh, the, uh, go ahead, the floor is yours. And thanks very much for uh, being with us these days. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Francisco, for the invite and to all your team um, for you know making this happen. I'm gonna share uh, my presentation here with you guys. Um, I'm assuming you all have access. I mean, I see in the screen, but if not, please let me know. Um, just a brief introduction myself, and maybe then I can do the same. My name is Carmen Gonzalez Romero. I work at the IRI, the International Research Institute for Climate Society. I'm living with Angel, the, um, the Latin American work on climate services. Uh, in particular, we're working on agriculture, but also public health and, and risk management. And well, I don't wanna take a lot of time. Um, I'm gonna let Angel introduce himself and then you know, um, we're gonna talk about some particular work that we've done in Guatemala. Uh, in relation to public health and climate services. Thank you, Carmen. And uh, hello, everyone. My name is Angel Munoz. As, as uh, Paco and Carmen said, <clears throat> I work at the IRI. I'm a, a climate scientist by training. And um, lately, uh, Carmen and I and several others at the IRI have been exploring um, the type of uh, models and early warning systems and um, an ecosystem of climate services as the, the one that Carmen is going to be discussing. I'm actually here, um, you know, we, we are going to be um, meeting with uh, several people at the BSC today and tomorrow. But since I already talked a lot in <laughs> December, I think that uh, Carmen is the only one like talking today. Of course, we can, you know, discuss things during the uh, Q&A session, but um, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for the invitation, you all. So um, I'll be leading the presentation, but to be honest, I'm not going to take all the credit because it wouldn't be fair. This is a team effort. Um, so this work that I'm going to be presenting um, is being co-developed uh, with Anjo, who is here. You just heard him. Simon Mason, who is another colleague from the IRI, and Juan Roberto Mendoza, who works for the Secretary of Food Security and Nutrition of Guatemala. So. In terms of what we're going to present today, uh, we're going to do, well, I'm going to do an introduction of the research, very brief, uh, just to give you some context of how this research started. Then we're going to talk about uh, food insecurity in Guatemala and how to understand it, the main drivers. Then we're going to go into um, the demand-driven component of, the, of this project which is to generate a country level next gen forecast system to forecast cases of acute nutrition for children under five. Then after that, we're gonna go into how we also following this demand driven approach, uh, we were asked to create a department level forecast system. Then we're gonna go through some conclusions and eventually um, I would love to have uh, a discussion with you, uh, your feedback, what you think about the work and, you know, and overall, you know, how could it be improved? Um, so first thing first, how this research started. Um, we've been working in, um, in these six countries uh, for the past four years, well, four and a half, through a project called ACT Today, or Adapting Our Culture to Climate Today for Tomorrow. Angel and I lead the uh, Latin American component of it. I'm not going to talk a lot about the project itself. 
just to mention that it follows the climate services approach um, that's been developed by IRI for the last 25, 28 years. And the objective of the project is to help countries to achieve SDG2 through the development or co-development of climate services. In this particular case, for those who are not very familiarized with the SDGs, the SDG2 um, aims to end hunger, achieve food security and improve nutrition through sustainable agriculture. So what's the situation in Guatemala when we got there four, four and a half years ago? Um, for those who don't know this, Guatemala, um, it's uh, the richest country in Central America, but yet they suffered the, um, the longest chronic cases of acute undernutrition in the region too, which is a bit um, weird <laughs> when you think about it. But here you just have a few um, 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 screenshot of different media outlets describing how critical the situation is. In some municipalities, according to the national statistic, the cases of and the nutrition for children under five, which is 50% of the children. So it, it's been a big focus, not only for the government, but also, also for international organizations and NGOs, and obviously the communities and the families. So when we got to Guatemala four years ago, we started to talk to different uh, um, stakeholders. Um, and we partnered with the SAN, which is the Secretary of Food Security and Nutrition. We didn't, I mean, the, the IRA approach is not to reinvent the wheel, but to go and talk to the, um, our partners on the ground, see what their needs are, understand what the situation they are at the moment, uh, what they have in place, which are the processes, and what can be improved based on, on the current situation they have and, and the needs that they have at that point. So when we got there, CESAN, which is the Secretary of Food Security and Nutrition, uh, they had a monitoring system in place. Um, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. I'm not gonna go, go through a lot of details, but if you have more questions at the end, you can ask. But pretty much they have um, a system. It's, uh, it's a very long process. Um, it involves a lot of people. Uh, it's not very objective. And they eventually with the information collected from that monitoring system, they develop warning systems and the whole uh, process is called Sala Situacional. This is an example of what they need in order to monitor and collect the data. Uh, this Sala Situacional, it's a, it's a self-reporting um, self method. It's pretty much a, a survey that they develop, um, that they develop and, and, and deliver through a selected group of villages and communities, and they have around 19 variables. Some of them are correlated, and based on that information that they collect from the communities, then um, an organization uh, within the Salas Situacional analyzes it and decide whether the situation is critical, is acceptable, or, or you know, they they define which level of warning needs to be uh, needs to be established based on that. So it's very, um, it's not very objective in that sense. There, there, I mean, it's useful, but there are some things that we realize could be improved. So um, this is an, um, just um, a picture shared by Cezanne of how they collect the information, how they digi digitalize it. It's, it's, it's actually very good in terms of you've got here the maps, you've got different departments, the situation in the different departments. They look at the uh, amount of grains that they have in reserve. Um, at, reported by the farmers and, and, the, and the families. They also look at how much of the harvest has been impacted by climate hazard. What is the situation? These represent a number of days without rain. They also look at uh, socioeconomic factors, like is there a temporal employment? There is not. They look at um, what they call the um, hunger season. The, Local institutions and government in Guatemala, they have defined there's a uh, hunger season between April to September. So they have, they created this kind of calendar where it shows how does it fit within the different harvest system of the of staple food. So they look not only at climate elements, but also socioeconomic elements. And, you know, um, I've, it's, it's used for internal purposes only, it's not public, uh, it's not publicly available. But you know, this is something that um, we found that they had. It, it, it looks good. It is. It is. 
it is useful, but you know, again, um, maybe the methodology and the base of this representation could be improved. So we um, we talked to the Sun and we decided to um, you know to work with them to improve this those part of the work that could be improved. So first thing first, when we uh, we went and talked to our partners, um, we identified what they what they needed and what they had. We went into uh, learning or understanding what were the main food insecurity drivers in Guatemala. So we looked at uh, literature review. We also talked to local um, local experts, and we looked at the information that Cezanne was gathering and, and using. Here, uh, oops, sorry. Yeah. Here, um, what we did, we grouped all those variables into you know the drivers of food security, which is. Um, of, I mean, that's the standardized in the literature. And what we identified or what we saw is that, um, well, we needed to, to co-develop an objective operational uh, early warning system with them because at that moment they didn't have it. We were looking into all the variables. Of course, we, we could see straightforward that, you know, we're going to have some limitations, not only in the, in the, um, um, not only in terms of the data, the amount of data collected, but how um, uh, how how they're going to fit into the models, and and how much data we could robust data, robust data we could get from them. So eventually, what we realized is that um, we didn't have access to uh, um, robust um, time series of grain reserves. Uh, what, but we could use precipitation uh, level, or we also looked at the lack of precipitation in uh, in Guatemala. We didn't have robust data uh, in terms of uh, sick animals or crop loss. Um, it was very difficult to get data data on, on daily wages, what they call jornales, um, because well, the economy there is not very. Um, I mean. Households really rely on, on the, B, kind of the economy. So it's difficult to get data on that. But we did look at the, uh, the variables that are highlighted in red, particular precipitation, uh, the prices of uh, basic grains, uh, other crop prices, uh, basic food basket price, and also cases of acute nutrition for children under five. Um, so Sun also provided information and, and data of uh, respiratory diseases and digestive diseases of children under five. However, um, due to inconsistency of the data, we couldn't use it in this case, um, which is a pity. But anyway, we understood that these were the main drivers. Uh, we're including climate drivers and non-climate drivers. And then we move into, um, into the, the next gen methodology and see how could we um, using the methodology has been um, developed by IRI for the last 25 years, we could, whether we could develop this objective forecast system. So the first thing we we looked at was a conceptual model. Um, it was it was validated by by Susan. We did different analysis to um, to support this conceptual model that we had built here. Um, our hypothesis. Then we looked at from all the different um, potential uh, predictors, which ones we could use as candidate predictors. And then we continue into a selection model um, process. And eventually with all those models, we did an, an ensemble or a combination of, um, of multiple, wait, I'm gonna move this here. I don't know if you can see this, um, of multiple forecast models for the nutrition in Guatemala. This is an excellent methodology. Um, many of you have already heard of it. Uh, Angel explained it uh, here at Bertano Supercomputing Center in December. Uh, if you have more questions, we can go into it. But I'm more interested in you, um, you know, um, continuing with with this presentation. Um, so once we have established um, the data, uh, well, we identify the needs, uh, the context where our partners work. Uh, we looked into the drivers of food insecurity in Guatemala, especially for children under five. Uh, then we establish a methodology. Next step would be to go back to our local partners and, and, and following this demand driven approach, try to scale, to skillfully forecast monthly acute nutrition in the whole country of Guatemala. So, what we looked at uh, the first thing was the level of precipitation because uh, both when you go, when you look at literature, 
um, in Central America um, and also some um, other parts of the world. And also when you talk to people on the ground, whether they're farmers or government officials or um, international organizations, they'll tell you the same story. Um, children are having like, issues with acute nutrition because there's a lack of rainfall and therefore, you know, we don't have food. People don't have food to eat and families can feed their children. And then, so we went into analyzing um, the relationship between precipitation and, and cases of acute nutrition. The red line here in the graph shows the cases of acute nutrition per month from 2010 to beginning of 2017. Well, end of 2016, sorry. Um, this data was provided by Cezanne and the green light shows uh, the precipitation. Uh, we use CHIRPS, the, uh, and this is monthly data, again, from 2010 to 27, 2016. And what we saw is that, well, um, actually the, the number of cases of acute nutrition kind of is similar to the distribution uh, of the representation of the rainfall. Even sometimes you can clearly see the patterns um, how the pattern of the cases follow the pattern of the precipitation. And through a cross correlation function, we identified that the time between the reduction of uh, precipitation level and the peak of case acute nutrition is four months. We got um, super excited about that, but you know, from the identification of the drivers, we um, uh, we knew we, we not climate couldn't really explain it all. We need to include socioeconomic factors. So then we started to look to do. We did the same analysis for for the other drivers that, um, that I mentioned before. Here, what you can see is the standardized time series from 2010 to 2016 on a monthly uh, basis of acute nutrition, which is the red line again, and maize price, which is this um, yellowish line. Uh, then you got uh, the beans price, which is the, uh, I don't know if you can see it properly, at least the, the dark green, no, or, or, well, sorry, not the, the gray one. And then the rainfall is the, is the green, um, the, the green line. Um, we need to standardize the data to be able to compare and to do sensor analysis. It looks very busy there, but I just wanted to show you the whole um, time series of all the variables you know, um, included in the analysis. Um, we didn't remove the seasonality there because, uh, again, we wanted to kind of validate the finding that we're having with the conceptual model, especially of those from um, of the conceptual model of our stakeholders. They, as I mentioned before, they claim there is a um, hunger season, is the red box here, from mid-April to end of August, September. Um, and what we, see is that what we saw is that it actually, um, it actually matches. So, you know, we were, it is a sad story, but we were happy about the results. So once we, um, we, um, we identify the, the drivers uh, the, or the candidate predictors that we could use, then we went into building different models um, to identify which models would be the best, the one that would suit better. Uh, here, you got a list of models from one to 12. At the beginning, we only use um, um, single candidate predictors, in this case, rainfall, uh, frequency of dry days, uh, May price, uh, uh, beans price, etc., and then a combination of all of them. We also included coffee price because originally, um, originally, um, especially if you look at literature review, but also if you go on the ground, you see that um, everyone claims that coffee has a major impact on food security because it's considered a cash crop. However, what we, I'll, I'll show you later, but uh, we didn't identify a clear signal. But anyway, I'm not gonna go, let's go step by step. What we saw is that model number nine and number 12 are the ones that um, are more suitable to, or more skillful to develop the early warning system. We also identified the lag between these predictors and, and the peak of acute nutrition um, is between four and three months. And we use two um, uh, methods, oops, sorry, uh, two methods to identify the, the, the right models. One, we use big, 
uh, Bayesian information uh, criteria, pretty much the lower the number is, the, um, the more, um, the, the better fit the model is. And then we also use uh, Kendall Staus and the bigger the, the Kendall Stau is, um, also the, um, the more skillful the, the model is. So as you can see here, number nine and number 12 are the ones with a higher uh, Kendall Stowe. Um, and then we decided to, sorry, this is moving ahead. We decided to stick to number nine because um, Kendall Stowe is slightly higher than the model number 12. And now uh, we then um, continue with, uh, with analysis of the model uh, using model number nine. What you can see here on, on the graph is uh, the red lines have the actual observation uh, on a monthly basis from 2010 to 2016. The solid blue line is a next-gen cross-validated hindcast. And we use a 12-month window uh, to train the, the model. And the dotted line, dotted blue line, is uh, the next-gen retroactive hindcast. Um, for that, we use four years to train the period and three years out of sample verification. What you see here, um, that this kind of blue or purplish envelope is a, um, is a um, uncertainty envelope of the, um, 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 of, of the retroactive handcast. And finally, um, we also looked at the rock of the model, model number nine, which we were super, super happy. You got it here on the right-hand side. Um, for those who are not very familiarized with this, um, it's a discrimination um, method or criteria. And pretty much it discriminates how good the, the forecast is for, uh, um, for forecast above and below, um, and below normal. And just for those who are not very familiarized with this, the closer the two lines get to, to the, this axis, the, the, the more skillful the forecast is. So if we got the two lines very close to uh, this heat rate line and, and this uh, false alarm rate line, that would mean perfect, the forecast. Obviously, this is a model, it cannot, it cannot be perfect, but you know, this, this shows a very positive um, result, not only for us, but also for the sun. Um, so, okay, so what does it mean from, um, from a local perspective, from, from, our, uh, from a demand-driven approach? That means that by using uh, observed rainfall, we could, uh, we could, sorry, uh, we could forecast um, in advance, sorry, we could forecast in advance the, the number of cases of nutrition in the whole country. So if we use rainfall from today, we could see what would be the case of the nutrition in four months time. But if we wanna look at what's the situation today, we will have to look at the rainfall of four months past and so on. But all, this also means that we could use a forecast of subseasonal or seasonal forecast of rainfall to um, forecast cases, um, you know, um, longer, longer the line. So that's, um, that's, um, that's fantastic, not only for us as researchers, but from Cezanne, uh, because they will be able to, um, to act, uh, react, um, to, so act, not react to the, um, to the situation they're facing. So, of course, this for us was, um, was like a big party, you know, um, this fantastic, uh, the result of the research is amazing, but if we go back, when we go back to present and presented this information to the sun, they were, well, congratulations. Um, this is super encouraging. However, we need the same information per department because um, we work uh, with our officials in the different departments and, you know, we need to tackle the situation um, in a realistic way. Like the information at country level is useful, but yet we need per department. So we did the same, uh, we applied the same methodology, we did the same analysis for the 22 departments of the, of the country. I'm not gonna show you every single graph because you know, we don't have time for that. But here, um, just so you, just, so, just to give you a little bit of a sense, uh, we looked at the relationship between acute and nutrition, in this case, the line are the blue ones, and rainfall 
for each one of the departments. And we saw that there had different lags, which, you know, makes sense. Uh, and also depending on which or how dependent on agriculture the department is, maybe the relationship is stronger and is more obvious and the pattern of the nutrition follows the pattern rainfall more, more clearly. Um, we also looked at the lag for each one of the departments through a cross correlation function. These two images show the same information is just for, again, for our Ernest Sands perspective and our local partners perspective. Um, visualizing the data through a map was way more useful than, you know, using um, this graph. We looked at the maize price um, for each one of the departments. We looked at the beans price for each department. And we also looked at coffee because originally literature review suggested that we should include it. However, as you can see here, the signal wasn't very clear and we decided to remove it from the, the 12 models. We decided to select number nine instead of number 12 because the tau, Kendall's tau was higher without the coffee than with the coffee. Um, so uh, eventually what we developed through was a, a next gen forecast system for Q and the nutrition. Uh, the image on the left hand side shows uh, the um, uh, generalized rock. Um, pretty much um, it's a discrimination metric. So anything that stays above 50% um, is considered better than using the equivalent of climatology. I mean, I'm using the climatology term, but here we're talking about case of human nutrition, but since there's a lot of people that, you know, they're climate scientists, I thought, you know, this would make sense, this comparison. Um, this is the forecast we used for June 2017. Sorry, it's January, it's not June. Um, January 2017. And what we saw is that, um, well, in, we didn't, um, um, the forecast didn't match the actual observations for the department. The, it did fall within the, sorry again. <laughs> It is fall uh, within the the envelope uh, uncertainty envelope that we identify. So you know this is good news. Um, this was all demand driven, and you know at this point, Sasan was super excited because they will be able to to improve the system that they had. Um, we were talking about um, possible use of the information. Uh, how who are they going to apply? the the information provided and what they what they suggest is that well they could use this information to uh in in coalition with other policies like they use the school meal program in guatemala and um basically a school meal program they feed the children to also promote or increase literature uh literacy rates so the idea is to use those channels that are already implemented through that school meal program to target uh, or to aim to reduce the case of human nutrition in that particular region or, or department. Um, but they also, they would allow them to, to plan and act than react. Um, there's a lot of, they have a lot of national plans uh, and different um, level of policies um, that they keep developing them, but they're very, they have like a diagnostic um, approach. Um, and with this, they will, they will allow them to tackle, um, to tackle a case of nutrition, a more um, kind of um, specifically, you know, to each region and to the context of each region. Um, but also, also super important, is that we've been talking about prediction of rainfall, but because we're using socioeconomic factors too to develop the forecast system, we're going to be able to do a scenario, scenarios of what would happen if you know the trade agreement between Central America and America comes to an end, and out of the sudden Guatemala decides not to protect maize. Uh, what happens if Mexico stops um, protecting the national production of maize? Because at that moment, you know, I'm not going to get a lot of into details, but a lot of the um, maize have been smuggled into a country comes from Mexico, which is cheaper and that has an impact on food security. And 
and also coming from Honduras with a similar situation, you know, they can, the government could also do projection in these scenarios on socioeconomic factors and, and also kind of um, try to tackle them, try to tackle the situation that way. And all in all, it allows for a proactive versus a reactive approach, which is what they've been following um, until now. Um, additionally to this, um, they needed to have something like a digitalized tool similar to the one that, um, that, you, that I showed you earlier. So we're developing with them um, like a portal. The idea is not only to show uh, or to monitoring the case of care and the nutrition, but to work on the actual forecast. Um, we are working on, with them on, on the development of this portal and following what IRI has been, um, has been working with different governments, maybe the forecast element might be internal for the sun, but the monitoring one would be public for, for everyone to, to use it, which also helps with transparency, <laughs> um, you know, which it, it's important here. So especially in countries like Guatemala, and well, there are a couple of references I just want to mention because, you know, because of the, the graphs um, that you saw, the main paper is in preparation, but there are a couple of, um, of small, well, the paper and a poster presented at AGU and paper um, um, led by Chris White, where you can find information uh, of the work if you're interested. And uh, this is it. I don't know if I've taken a lot of time or not. Hopefully um, this will trigger questions and thoughts um, and the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much, Carmen. Uh, it was very much on time. Actually, uh, the, you, you were quite succinct and, uh, and really concise, uh, and, which is always very, very welcome. <clears throat> I, I have a few questions myself uh, uh, about uh, what you presented here, but I, I think I'll, I'll leave the, uh, the, the floor to those who have questions. Uh, there, there, is, there are no questions in the chat right now. Uh, but if anyone has a question or wants to raise a comment, uh, raise your hand in the uh, in the list of participants in Zoom, or if you're in the room, um, I, I guess that the only one in the room now is Rachel. Rachel, yeah. uh, please, uh, <laughs> please just uh, go ahead with it. I Any have a quick question? Oh, she has a question. Okay. okay. Um, Should we move over here so you can go? Uh, we we can hear Rachel. Oh, you uh, if, it, yeah. If you if you go ahead, Rachel. Uh, oh. If 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 we have problems to hear you, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, speak up. Thank you, Carmen. That was really really fascinating talk and gave me lots of ideas. I was wondering, um, in terms of the the visualization of the uh, your sort of like impact based forecast, mm -hmm. did you have you had any feedback about? You know, how they actually want to visualize it and the, the kinds of colors they might want to see or yeah so um this is i mean we everything we've done here even though i've been mentioned it but maybe um i didn't really specify how we did it it's been everything co-designed which it's a little bit time consuming but i think it's good for sustainability once the project finishes and, and everything is done pretty much with a validation of the sun or a co-design with the sun. So in this case, um, we had a first talk with them. Uh, so how do you how do you visualize the 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 tool? Which colors do you want to use? Uh, how which logos? Uh, which information? What? And we show them different options like a draft it. Um, and a, actually, it was a PowerPoint originally. <laughs> And then once they agreed on one particular design, then we moved into actual creating it. And it go, we go step by step. Any change that we do, we report to them. Uh, it's like we are their consultant. <laughs> okay. How do you want it? How do you want the cake? You want a, a big, small? You want a pink? You want a white? How? And so the colors they 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 suggested the, the colors. Also, they wanted this logo. Um, if you look at the website of Cezanne, mm. um, it has it's pretty much blue in different um, in different versions of it, and that's how they wanted it. So, so what are you actually mapping here? 
what, what's on the scale there? Sorry, oh, I can't read it. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Uh, this is the number of acute of cases of acute nutrition for children under five uh, since this is uh, January 2010 on a monthly basis. We're using um, monthly data because it's what how they monitor it and how they they make mm -hmm. decisions based on, based mm -hmm. on monthly data. And the idea is for people, for Susan, for um, for researchers, for anyone who's interested in this, to be able to play um, with the graph here. The the map will update based mm -hmm. on the cases mm -hmm. of acute nutrition for that particular month in that particular year. And, and yeah, because when we when we were working with partners in Barbados, they were very specific about how they wanted the actual forecasts and the actual probabilities displayed, and they were really dead set on this sort of traffic light scheme. Well, but I was just curious to know if they were interested in that here or not. They they told us we need it monthly because we review the data monthly. Um, the they i think they should report to the president too and it's all the whole government works on, on monthly scales mm -hmm. so um having a the beginning we're talking about seasonal uh seasonal information and they were like for you you know, it might be useful but for us we don't need um information on a seasonal scale we need a monthly so that was the, the very um one of the main concerns they had but and if, if i may i think that um rachel's also asking about the color scheme so something interesting there, indeed, everything has been co-developed from scratch uh, with Cezanne and other um, decision makers in Guatemala. But we um, thought that something a bit more radish would be like more important to, um, or maybe suitable to emphasize how um, bad certain departments might be at a particular time. Mm -hmm. And they said, we don't want anything red. Yeah. We want actually you to use, because we already have this monitoring system and everything is blue there. Mm -hmm. We ask you to change from the color scale that you're using to the color bar that we are using, which is this one. Mm -hmm. So it has been, you know, that uh, mm -hmm. also regarding the color scheme has been a very important thing. So actually you will see that the forecasts are always in this uh, same color bar. Yeah. And what you are seeing on the left is 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 a skill map, mm -hmm, yeah. and they said, you know, we don't care about the skill yeah. map. They should <laughs> be very. Yeah. They should pay a lot of attention to skill. But they were like, whatever color you want to use for skill, we we don't use. It. Mm -hmm, so. Yeah, I think. I mean, the situation is very dramatic. But and uh, if we would have put a, they think if you put a red map, that would bring like more attention to the problem wow. uh, than blue. Um, um, you know, it's. If you have everything in red, it's very scary. Like, oh my yeah. gosh, you know, where well, the blue kind of smoothes it a little bit, even right. though, you know. Yeah, this, this, this uh, session has been recorded, so we cannot say oh. a lot. Yeah, okay. But <laughs> just so you know, um, there might be some governments um, <laughs> interested in not showing how bad certain scenarios or situations are in the past or in the foreseeable uh, future. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, let's <laughs> not get ourselves in trouble. <laughs> yeah, it seems that this is not the uh, the only the only time I've heard of similar similar things, and that somehow it it really points at the importance of these cold developments and uh, this idea of not assuming that uh, anything that you're doing is going to be useful automatically. Mm -hmm. um, any more questions? <clears throat> I don't see any hands in the list of participants. I can I can go ahead with uh, one question from my side. Um, <clears throat> the when, one of the things that uh, caught my attention is the uh, uh, short time series that you have available. So data are what they are, and uh, and uh, I'm sure that monitoring this is is far from trivial for for the government. Um, but somehow, how do you uh, how do you uh, assess the quality of this data, which is critical when you have such a short time series, and, uh, and how do you also uh, include in your model and in your analysis any uh, confounding factors like, for instance, interventions, so uh, uh, campaigns that are targeting uh, and their nutrition and, uh, and, and that might run only for a short period, one or two years? Um, well, we they did have data prior to 2010. However, they changed the data collection method in 2010, and they followed the um, OMS um, 
standard guidance of, of how to collect um, data for human nutrition and, and, and how, to, um, how to divide cases into the different categories. So they told us specifically to start the analysis from 2010 because they couldn't guarantee enough quality control from data prior to 2010. However, because this is not new data, it looks like we're only doing like seven data points, seven, seven years, but in reality, we got 84 because it's monthly data for six, for seven years. So we got 84 um, data times. So we, um, we get the cases of acute nutrition as robust in terms of quality data as robust as they can, they can be. And because we got 84 uh, data points, um, we're confident that um, you know, the analysis is robust enough uh, when we look at uh, climatology, we look at 30 data points. So in that sense, we, you know, we're, um, we're happy with what the results are showing. Um, in terms of the, the, um, um, the interventions and, and how they, they do it, we did uh, remove the seasonality um, because they tend to target um, or the actions tend to be tend to focus on that uh, hunger season. When we did the analysis, removing the seasonality and standardizing the the data, uh, we're controlling from the main um, the main um, impacts of those programs. If I, if yeah. I, may, I generally hear you, Paco, and we were discussing this at length with Simon when we started this work. And Carmen remembered that <laughs> those were like uh, pretty interesting conversations. Um, so the thing is that indeed we need, we cannot follow a traditional more like discrete approach in which you only use the Januarys to forecast the Januarys or the Februarys to forecast the Februarys, whatever that is. This is a continuous modeling approach. So all models, the, the model is being trained considering all mo all months available. So it's not the more traditional one in which you have, I don't know, 30 years in climate and then you forget January, February, and March or whatever using only January, February, and March. That will be the discrete approach. We use here the 84 month with all the cross-validation and retroactive approach that Carmen explained to be able to fit uh, the parameters, to be able to build a different model. So it's a, it's, a, it's a different one. And in terms of sampling, after we have done everything that Carmen mentioned with the you know, this is this is analyzing the time series, which is not trivial, as we can imagine, as we can probably see here. Um, that was, um, you know, like robust enough in terms of sampling. I, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, and, and the the uh, my my other comment was more about the intervention. So things that happen uh, in any odd year. So for instance, following some, uh, some elections uh, and, and in which uh, some programs are put in practice and then they only last one or two years and then they disappear and that they, uh, somehow this affects uh, as well the numbers. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that it doesn't affect as much as precipitation, but I, I wonder if this is a factor that you also want to consider. Um, yeah, I mean, um... So Sun is the one in charge of kind of developing and and using also all the parts that are going to implement it. Um, the thing is that from their perspective, the most useful uh, programs that they've, that they've been having in lately is the school meal program. Um, but yet those that program doesn't impact children under five necessarily because um, you know it, it, children under five they don't necessarily need to be um, enrolled in school yet at that at that age. Um, so we they weren't very concerned about the impact that those programs might have on children under five. Um, they're they were very con well not not concerned but they were they were very interested to see whether we could work with um, the acute digestive and acute respiratory uh, disease information that they had, uh, because they, according to their conceptual model, that will have a bigger impact uh, to explain and to forecast acute and nutrition for children the five than the actual programs. Um, however, and unfortunately, because I was super excited, they provided us with the data, but 
um, it wasn't robust enough because they didn't have enough time. So we could include it in the analysis. Yeah, but you are right. You know, so formally we haven't included that here for the different reasons that Carmen has uh, mentioned. Like the the data, you know, sometimes you cannot compare the kind of uh, the strategies that have been implemented by different governments. Sometimes, like uh, it's unclear what they have done or not. <laughs> Uh, again, we're being recorded here, so I think that um, you know it, that would be awesome if we can include an additional uh, predictor that um, offers information about um, you know what um, a particular government has done in the past or what could be done better because we have that kind of modeling tools. But it's not included here, as you can see. It's more like uh, socioeconomic factors, um, not including you know what you are asking and and climate. So yeah, that will be a nice thing. We discussed this also. Um, we haven't gone into the details, but these are, and we can explain the details if you want, but these are um, PCR models, not COVID PCR. <laughs> this is a principal component regression one uh, uh, to avoid type one and type two um, statistical errors. But um, you know, in those, it's not very easy to include like a spike with the inter intervention. So we were discussing with Simon ways to include these, you know, um, I'm going to call those like binary or binomial uh, uh, interventions. So you, you did it or you didn't and how, how much you did it. And then uh, we, we won't, you know, we discussed that at length, but then we didn't have enough data to actually feed the model. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question on the in the chat by Chung. Uh, I don't know, Chung, if you want to uh, formulate a question yourself. Thank you, Paco. Uh, thanks for the interesting presentation. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, when looking at the, the final blue maps, that you can pick the particular month in the particular year. So I'm wondering if there's any feedback from the users regarding uh, the uncertainties of the case, the number of the cases, or how how we should show the uncertainties of the forecast. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you. This is a very uh, this is a very tricky question because users are not used to, uh, or at least you know from my experience here in this work, they're not used to work with uncertainty envelopes, um, and they're very afraid. No, not afraid, but they're, um, they want to have a number uh, or a threshold to work with, not three different values. <laughs> um, so it, it, there is a, a, an element mm. of training them along the way. And because um, at this point, my, my best answer would be because we've been working with them and uh, since the very beginning, and we have been explaining what it means, uh, what the system could do, they're more, um, um, they're more um, favorable to, to include those. Um, they tend to look at this one, um, the, um, the maximum forecast and, and, and the actual forecast, rather the minimum one. But you know, that might be just my experience with them. Um, not, I cannot generalize. Um, based on that, but it, it, it is difficult um, because also um, depending on who you work in the government, then maybe they're used to categorical uh, forecasts. Um, but anyway, um, it, it's not always easy. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or giving you the answer that you were expecting, but it's not easy. It helps um, if you work with them and they, they feel like they, they own the product and, and, and you're kind of doing inception along the way. Mm -hmm. So they eventually understand and, I, and accept the, um, the uncertainty envelope. Not sure if Angel yeah, has something I, I guess else. I, I completely agree with you. And uh, I don't know if, um, if um, this is the kind of answer that you want, but originally we, set, we offer probabilistic forecasts. You know, you can convey the information of this is what we expect, and this is the uncertainty associated with that. And they were like, probably what? What we want is a perfect model. You are supposed yeah. to give us perfect numbers. So why do we need three different maps? And it's like, oh man, it doesn't work like that. So you know, we uh, they definitely want something that is more like deterministic in nature, 
So right now, uh, Carmen Sagini is to do these things with them, like, you know, like sitting with them and what we call like um, the smooth inception to, to, you know, talk to them until they realize as their own idea that, oh, we're being recorded, <laughs> that um, a probabilistic, both a probabilistic and deterministic approach, a combination of those two approaches to convey uncertainties in the forecast has value. Not only one, which might be, they are more familiar with the first one, that's perfect, let's start there, but there's more that we can do. As you, I don't know if you guys were um, uh, there in December when I talk about the next gen approach and using the probab probability of exceedance, we're trying to, um, um, you know, provide that information to here. The model is actually producing those outputs in terms of probabilities for pair styles or, or, you know, like any threshold or probabilities of exceedances. But right now they feel comfortable, as Carmen said, like uh, considering uh, the maximum value and the mean forecast, the expected uh, value for the forecast. They, for obvious reasons, they are not that um, interested in the minimum one. And you also note that, um, you know, from a technical perspective, this is not a Gaussian, uh, it, it doesn't follow a Gaussian distribution. So your error bar is not symmetric. So you actually need, if it, as they wanted, like to have the maximum and the minimum, we need to provide those three panels. In some other cases, you know, like just one, one panel with the mean forecast and plus minus a standard deviation or whatever that is, might be enough. So there is a lot of work with them behind, you know, how to present these things. I, I don't know if we're answering your question. Yes, oh, no. yes, thank you. It takes time, but it pays off at the end. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of time when you are not like just writing the paper, but interacting with the decision makers. Yeah. It takes time, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, um, I have another question, unless anyone wants to take the floor and uh, ask something else. Um, the, there are other countries uh, in, in, in Central America, and uh, it's, it's, it's always fascinating from Spain to, to uh, realize how complex the situation is there. Um, I wonder if uh, there are any plans to transpose this experience to other countries. Probably they don't have the, uh, the, the uh, monitoring system that Guatemala has. Yeah, um, so yes, the short answer is absolutely. Um, but um, we promised we didn't pay Paco to ask that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've been working with uh, CRH, which is Comité Regional de Recursos Hídricos, or the Regional Committee for uh, Water Resources in, in Central America. They organize the Climate Outlook Forums, and they do have one week of they call it the technical forum where the Met services come together and they discuss the seasonal forecast for the next three months. And then the second week is more like, um, I don't want to call it political, but a more, um, yeah, let's call it political, where they use that forecast to, um, and they present it to different governments of the region. Um, they use it for different applications. And through CRH, the, the, the government of the region is TICA, um, and through CRH, this regional committee, um, they're interested in expanding the public health uh, application of the forecast. Uh, we presented the work, they're very interested, and hopefully, um, you know, um, we're going to continue working with them. And we know, at least from the meteorological point of view, the uh, the agencies they were interested in having products like that and according to the director of the regional committee also from an application perspective the government will also be interested so we're in that um kind of phase of scaling it up we need to do all the analysis this is a very tailored um and a specific system for guatemala we cannot guarantee we're gonna be that successful in other countries but the idea is to replicate the model, um, analyzing the, the nutrition drivers in each one of the countries because they might vary. They might be similar because it's a similar region as well, but um, we cannot uh, promise specific results. Uh, we need to do analysis first. But yeah, that'd be amazing. Okay, thanks very much, Carmen. <clears throat> so, I don't see any more hands nor questions in the chat. So um, I take advantage of thanking you for, for the talk and also for addressing our questions. 
uh, and uh, also to thank you as well for the uh, meetings that you are going to have with us in the next uh, couple of, well, today and tomorrow. Um, so uh, remember that uh, for those who are at the BSC, uh, they are staying in the um, video conferencing room, which is in the in Torre Girona building. Uh, and uh, the, if, if you have, uh, an, if you're interested in meeting with them, uh, send an email to Gabriela and uh, she'll uh, tell you what their agenda is uh, for these two days. Uh, and uh, I also would like to take advantage to thank uh, Albert and Gabriela for setting it up and uh, uh, also to Michelle for uh, hosting the, uh, the uh, uh, meeting from the uh, uh, education uh, team at the, at the BSC. So uh, thanks also to all the attendants. And uh, again, uh, uh, the, uh, it will be uh, very nice to meet you uh, this evening and also to have a chat with you there at the BSC. Thank you, and uh, see you soon. Thank you, Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.